good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I think most of you have been here for one or more of these. A couple of, I see a couple of new faces. Um, I guess mostly for the camera. I'm Seth Longbox, the president of Hildeen. Um, so welcome to our fourth and final installment of our series designed to help us better understand and appreciate our Baton Kill Valley landscape. Um, by the way, if anybody missed one of the early ones, I think they're all available on GNAD if you go and look them up. So you and, can and if, if they are, yet, they will be. Okay, they will be. So um, you will be able to see the full four if you want to, even if you've missed a couple. Um, because it is our final, let me again thank Dave Curtis for his discussion of the area's geologic history, Steve Ravel for his discussion about the area's hydrogeology and hydrogeologic history, and Alan Calfey for his discussion about the history and present status status of our forests. I'll come back to today's installment in a minute. Our mission <clears throat> is values into action, straight from Lincoln. Um, our core values, also straight from Lincoln, integrity, perseverance, and civic responsibility. And I guess if you remember one thing about all of this, remember civic responsibility, because that's really an organizing principle for everything that we do. Um, if you have values into action, you also have the key actions. Our actions are historic preservation, land conservation, we have formed in 12 acres, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, civil civic discourse, and sustainability. Today's program uh, relates to at least two of those, land conservation and sustainability. So just quickly, what's happening at Hildeen? What's going on now in this chapter of Hildeen's history is that we're working to bring our, the entirety of our 412 acres to life, make the entirety of 412 acres um, part of the uh, routine member and guest experience. Um, everything from our gardens to the goat dairy to the Pullman car. Um, one of the underrated assets of Hildeen is our trail system, um, that we have 12 miles of trails that we maintain well year round and that we really hope people, and they are in fact more and more taking advantage of that as, as people begin to realize that that is such an asset at Hildeen. So the next part now with all of this is returning the Dean, or the lower portion of Hill and Dean, down on River Road, returning that portion of our property to agriculture, the way that it was 100 years ago when the Lincolns were first here. So we are headed toward, and we're, we're well on our way, animals, um, a greenhouse which is already in place and is part of our deep-seated collaboration with Burn Burton and our high school program. And by the way, that we want that high school program to go to other high schools before we're done with this. Pollinators, focus on pollinators, our floating boardwalk, and all of this, again, under our core value of civic responsibility, doing our part to make the world a better place. Um, I'll come back to this theme in a second, too, and I'm sure Andrea will touch on it. Maybe she will. Um, um, one of the highest priorities of our forest management plan and everything that we do at Hildeen on the landscape is pollinators. Um, because in a way, they're like the, the one way to look at it is they're like the canary in the coal mine. Um, pollinators, as we all know, are threatened worldwide. And so one of the things that we're doing here is making sure that rather than do anything that harms pollinators and their ability to survive and c carry on their mission for the world, um, is to also um, provide habitat and food source for pollinators. And you'll, you'll see that theme across the property. It permeates everything that we do. So as many of you know, because you are members already, Membership allows access to Hildeen 360 days a year. We're open 360 days a year. Um, and we hope everybody here becomes a member. Um, there are some materials at the back and you can grab on your way out the door just explaining the next steps, giving people can give you a feel for where we're going. Um, and just one final thing before I introduce Andrea. I do this every week and I do it with enthusiasm is to thank GMAT, um, Greater North Shire Access Television. Um, provides a real service not just to us today through this four-part series, but as, as we all know, to the entire community day after day after day. It's really an, an indispensable asset. And um, so I just hope that everybody watching and everybody here today in their hearts uh, and maybe beyond their hearts, thanks GNAT for everything they do for, our, for the larger North Shire community. So, on to Andrea. Andrea, Andrea Lucchini is a native Vermonter. Um, she received her undergraduate degree from the University of Vermont in Anthropology in 1998. And that is, I think she would put it, uh, she spent a few years trying to avoid going to grad school. 
um, but like uh, so we realized that that was unavoidable and she ended up in graduate school um, I think starting in 03 and finished 02. 02 okay and completed her master's in plant and soil science from the UVM in 2005 um, she then spent there's more to Andrews like everybody's there's more more to the history but I'm just trying to consolidate here she then spent seven years at the North Carolina Arboretum where she helped to maintain gardens and eventually went on to supervise uh, garden staff and volunteers. That's in large part where Andrea got the first part of her uh, post, post master's <coughs> uh, hands-on training and experience. Four years ago, we were able to lure Andrea back to Vermont with the opportunity to take on Hildeen's Gardens and to help us develop the next chapters in Hildeen's history. One of the messages from this series is that the lines get blurred. You know, our series was about geology, forest, water, soil. You really, even though we're talking about them in segments, there really is no, they, they all blur together, they all, they're all interrelated. That's one of the messages of this. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> there's no hard and fast line between forestry and gardening and plants, plant and soil science because all things, all our living things and what we do in one area affects the other. That's why Andrea and Alan Caffey, uh, last week's or two weeks ago speaker, worked so closely together helping to develop our integrated pest management strategy and our policies about birds and pollinators because you really can't look at any of it in isolation. And that's where Andrea, one of the ways in which Andrea has been um, so valuable to Hildeen is helping think through those bigger policy issues and how everything interrelates, which of course comes from her scientific training. Um, Alan talked last week about the perception into which we can get lulled that our forests are static. You look at them one day, you look at them the next day, they look the same. Um, but of course, they do change constantly. You just don't see the change instantly. Um, and so the, you can create a perception in your mind that, that, uh, that they don't change. Um, we're gonna learn today that the same is true of soil. It's just, you know, we think of soil as just there, right? Well, soil isn't just there. Um, it is as interesting and as dynamic as forests in the area's hydrogeology, and it's a very appropriate uh, final chapter. And so, Andrea, thank you for doing this. Thank you all for coming on such a beautiful day. You know, I want to be outside, um, but we'll get out there soon. So I'm a gardener, so I work in and with the soil all the time and have become really passionate about healthy soils and what that means. Uh, and I'm up in the garden behind the house every day and I look at the Taconics and the Green Mountains and the Battenkill Valley below me. And so this series has been really fascinating for me as well to learn more about what I'm looking at. Um, and it's also been really great for me to dig into a deeper understanding of the soils of the area. Uh, and I'm happy to add my part and share with you what I have learned about soil. So first I just want to start about, uh, and talk about what soil actually is, what we mean by soil. Soil isn't just dirt. It's a lot more than that. It's air and water, particles and organic matter. And it's also the interface between all those different spheres. So it interfaces with the atmosphere, our air, and the plants and animals that are in it and above it, um, including humans, um, and the minerals from the rocks um, below, and then the water, mostly the, the groundwater um, and rivers and streams that interact with the soil. Soil is about 50% pore space, meaning the air and water, uh, and 50% solids, which is um, particles of rock, minerals, um, and that sort of thing. As w and then within that solid, there is um, organic matter, which includes living organisms, uh, fresh residue, fresh um, plant material, decomposing organic matter, and then stabilized organic matter, which is the humus um, that you may have heard about. Um, and I just want to point out that this pore space, the air and water, is just as important as the solid space within the soil um, for healthy plants. And for reference, I just threw this in here. Um, when people talk about soil, they talk about it in three different particle sizes, sand, silt, and clay. Um, and this is just a size reference of what that si particle size is. Um, sand is the biggest one. We can all picture a, a grain of sand. Silt is the next size, barely visible to the human eye. And then clay, you really can't see individual particles of clay. 
Um, and soil texture varies um, based on the percentage of each. All soil has a percentage of this, each of these in it. Um, but it varies depending on much. Um, so how do we get soil? Where does it come from? How does it form? It is uh, formed with the interaction of five factors. Parent material gives the physical, chemical, and mineralogical composition to the soil. Climate and organisms um, are the active forces that turn the parent material into soil. And then topography influences the formation mostly by its effect on water, whether water runs off or collects. Um, but aspect and elevation play a role as well. And then all these processes obviously take time. So does anybody know the main source of the parent material for our soil in this area? Limestone plays, the bedrock plays a role, but the main source of our parent material here is glacial deposits. So um, glaciers we know are these huge masses of ice that um, bulldoze an area as they come. They push down on the earth and bulldoze everything in its path. So as the glaciers came down through this area, I believe there were several, um, and we've heard about them in the past talks, um, they pushed the soil that was existing here off um, and exposed sort of the bedrock and brought rocks and soil from other areas down with it. Um, so there are, and uh, just as reference, the last speakers have said, the glaciers here were so thick they were even above the top of Mount Equinox. So that's, that's a whole lot of ice. Um, and the last glaciers left here about 10,000 to 15,000 years ago, depends on the source um, you read, but in that time frame. So in this area, there are ma three main types of glacial deposits that have affected our soil. The, the most widespread is glacial till. Uh, a lot of us have heard of that terminology before, glacial till. So this is the material that was beneath the mass of ice. It's an unsorted mix of rocks and boulders, um, small stones, and sand, silt, and clay. All mixed. This is um, not here, obviously, but this is a photo, I think, of Alaska, a retreating glacier. So this glacier has very recently departed, and this is the material that's left um, from that departure. In isolated locations in our area, we also have outwash deposits, which are leftover material from glacial meltwaters, which were like streams coming out of the glacier, and then lacustrine deposits, I believe that's how you say it, um, which were left over from glacial lakes. So the outwash deposits are more sorted materials, and then <clears throat> the lake deposits are finer particles. So while the glacial deposits are the bulk of our soil here <clears throat> today now, the bedrock, um, limestone is one of those bedrocks, also plays a role um, in our soil composition. So this um, map is just showing, it's a generalized geologic map of the state of Vermont. And it's just show, I just have it here to show that there are three diff distinctly different type of bedrock um, uh, types in our area. So we're, Hill Dean's about here, I think, in this map. Um, this is the Taconic. This is what um, is called the Vermont Valley. It's where the Batten Kill um, flows through the Vermont Valley. And then this is the Southern Green Mountains. Going back to um, the previous talks, especially Dave Curtis's first talk on the geology of the area, the Taconic Mountains have that base of limestone type rock, limestone and marble, um, with older slates on top of it. The Southern Green Mountains are more, mostly um, quartzites, I believe, a different type of rock. And then the Vermont Valley is that limestone and marble bedrock base. So limestone and marble, Dave explained <clears throat> that those uh, rocks were formed in the bottom of the ocean millions of years ago and were formed from the deposits of sea creatures, so dead sea creatures built up and made this rock. Those sea creatures were really high in calcium and magnesium. So that limestone rock, we call it calcareous um, type rock, they create calcareous soils, meaning calcium-based soils. And that's from those sea creatures long ago. Um, the calcareous soils are highly rich in nutrients, and I'm gonna talk about why in, in just a minute here. And then the non-limestone areas, like the Green Mountains and parts of the Taconics, where they have the slates, um, make soils that are few, have fewer nutrients and are more acidic in nature. 
So how do we get from that glacial till that I just talked about to what we consider soil? This is actually an example of primary succession, which we think about in forests, but happens um, as we form soil as well. So Steve Ravel, in his talk, in the second, I believe the second talk in the series, talked about weathering of rocks and how that happens. Harder rocks are broken down by physical means, so that's um, uh, freeze-thaw actions, mostly. Uh, and then the softer rocks, which includes the limestones and the marbles, are broken down more by chemical means. So that's the action of rainwater um, and groundwater working on the rocks to dissolve them. So then when we're talking about glacial till, we're actually coming in here. You've got that unsorted mix. There's probably some soil in there. There's some rocks and that sort of thing. So what happens is lichen or other simple organisms start to form on the top of those rocks. They slowly, obviously this takes a lot of time, um, as those um, plants or, or organisms, excuse me, die, they start to create a little bit of organic matter on the top there. This allows slightly larger plants to grow, which then send roots down into the um, subsoil there, whatever you want to call it, and that adds more organic matter. It's the roots um, push down and create organic matter down in there which then adds more soil, which then means bigger plants can grow, which adds more organic matter, which adds more soil, and you get the point. And then we get to what we know of as soil today. Uh, in our area, we also have, we have a third type of parent material, um, which is alluvial sediments. This is river um, uh, sediment. So that rivers bring with it sediments and rocks as it moves and deposits them during high flow events. Usually these are finer particles, but uh, as we know in large high flow events it could be um, quite sizable material as well. So this is a, a more recent addition to soil development than the bedrock and the glacial till. So as a topography as a factor that I mentioned before, the five factors, Topography plays a role in where soil is formed and, and how it's formed. I guess this graphic looks a little bit similar to this area, but the Green Mountains aren't quite so flat as that plateau there. Um, but same general gist of it. So on steep slopes, very little soil forms, partly because um, water doesn't stay there and, and can't um, weather the rock as well. And partly gravity sort of um, helps it flow downstream. So in the valleys, uh, <clears throat> soil collects and becomes um, thicker and usually uh, more rich because the nutrients are flowing downstream as well. So, and I mentioned aspect and elevation. Aspect is the direction of the slope. So um, uh, the, depending which way the mountain's facing, if it's south facing, that's gonna be warmer and in, contribute to um, more soil formation. Uh, and higher up creates microclimates. It's colder up there, so soil won't form as quickly. And then climate plays a role in soil formation as well. Climate influences the rate of weathering, which dictates that freeze-thaw activity. It also dictates the amount of rainfall, um, so the amount of water available for weathering and leaching. Climate also determines the rate of chemical and biological processes. So how fast the organisms can work on the organic matter creating that soil. Biological activity tends to be low in colder and wetter areas. And then climate also dictates the type of plants and animals present, which then determines the type of organic matter. So for example, coniferous trees um, tend to be more acidic in nature, so as they drop, they're acidifying the soil and don't have as many nutrients as deciduous leaves. That adds a lot more um, nutrients and, um, to the soil. And then again, all these processes take time. Vermont soils, our soils here, are actually considered young soils because they're only about 10,000 to 15,000 years old. I think that's pretty amazing, but they're young. So um, while each area has a very unique set of soil forming factors, scientists have actually been able to classify um, all the soils in the world into 12 different soil orders. So they're classified on a similar system um, as plant and animals are classified. 
and soil order is the highest level of that classification system. I just threw this in here to show how I think it's really neat to see how different soil can look in different parts of the world. <coughs> so they classify it based on the uh, soil profile. Um, soil scientists will dig pits um, that expose all these different layers of the soil. So a well-developed soil will show these different, they call the layers horizons um, within the soil profile. At the top, it's usually the organic um, matter layer. And then the A horizon, they call it, which is the topsoil layer that we usually dig into plant our plants and that sort of thing. Um, and then it goes on down from there until you get to the bedrock um, layer. So if you haven't been able to tell already, I love maps, especially colorful maps. This one's just showing the, those soil orders um, through the country. The different, you can see this green here is in the Midwest. Those are really the rich, fertile grassland soils um, there. And we have two general types, inceptosols and spotosols. It doesn't really matter um, what they're called, but I just like maps. Um, and the, all the soils, so the lowest level, the soil order, I said, is the highest level of classification for soil. Uh, the lowest level, which is equivalent to the species level in plant and animals, is called soil series. And a lot of places in the country have mapped the soil series um, throughout counties and states. So Bennington County has the Bennington County Soil Survey, and they have mapped soil, survey, uh, soil series throughout the whole county. And this is uh, available on the web, so I pulled up... Um, this is the general Hildeen property, um, and it's still probably small for y'all, but all these yellow lines are distinguishing different areas of soil series, and they have a little um, number next to it which um, goes to a particular soil series. This, um, this is just an example of the soil that's supposedly out in front of the house out here. This information is good. It just tells you the basic information about the soil. Uh, and they map this uh, for the suitability of the soil for certain um, uses. So you can see up here, this one says farmland classification, farmland of statewide importance. So they've identified certain soil series types to be good for farmland, good for woodland, that type of thing. This is saying, the parent material for this soil up here is a loamy till, so that glacial till that I was talking about. And then just as an example, this is uh, from down on the Dean, our lower part of our property along the Battenkill River there. Um, and this is an outwash terrace, that out outwash deposits that I spoke of previously. And this is also farmland. Prime farmland is a national um, classification for farmland, meaning this is um, prime farmland for the country to grow food on. Um, and parent material is loamy glacial fluvial deposit over sandy gravelly glacial fluvial deposit. And I can tell you for sure the gravel is definitely there. That soil is pretty, pretty tough to dig in. We even have a state soil, just like we have a state bird and a state flower. There's also a state soil, the Tunbridge soil. This is a woodland soil, and it's found throughout the state. It's, I think they did this because it's the most prevalent soil in the state. Um, but yeah, so without going into specific soil series in each area, we can still talk about some general characteristics of the soils in our three landform areas. So the Southern Green Mountains, the Taconics, and the Vermont Valley. The Southern Green Mountains, tend to have that more acidic, nutrient-poor soil because they lack that limestone base. Um, what nutrients are there are more tied up in the rocks, those harder rocks that don't um, chemically weather as easily. Um, and there are not as many nutrients in that type of rock to begin with. But these su soils support a lot of different growth. They support trees such as beech, red maple, yellow birch, hemlock, balsam fir and red spruce, shrubs such as hobblebush, and then herbaceous plants like pink lady slipper, red trillium, in Indian pipes, and Christmas fern. 
You'll find those all throughout the southern Green Mountains. In the Taconic Mountains, especially the eastern slopes of Mount Equinox um, and some other areas, are those calcareous soils that I talked about, so those calcium and magnesium rich soils. As uh, Steve Ravel, again, back to his talk, talked about how water is moving through that landscape of the softer limestone rocks, and that brings um, nutrients downslope with it. So down at the base of the mountain, there's some really nutrient-rich um, soil with this alkaline pH. So I just want to talk briefly about what that means. I keep talking about pH. Um, so these calcareous soils that, are say, that I'm saying have a basic or alkaline pH, the pH tends to be about 7 to 7.5 on a pH scale. The acidic soils in the southern Green Mountains can be closer to 5 or 5.5. This changes the availability. These bars across here, if you can't read them, are all different plant nutrients. So at the top, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Those are the three big plant nutrients. And then it goes down to ones that are needed in smaller quantities. Here's the calcium and magnesium that I keep talking about, all the way down to iron and manganese, boron, those types of things. So this green bar is showing where the most of those plant nutrients are available, what pH. And that's 6.5 towards 7.5. That's where most plants like to grow. These calcareous soils that we have here are a little bit higher but you can see how thick the bar on the calcium and magnesium is, as well as it's capturing the thick bars of most of the different types of plant nutrients. And that's why these are especially rich soils that can grow a great diversity of plants. So that diversity includes, in terms of trees, um, all the trees, all the plants that grow in the southern Green Mountains will also grow in these calcareous soils of the Taconics. Um, but they'll do even better in the Taconics, um, including sugar maples, basswood, and white ash. They do especially well in those calcareous soils. Spring ephemeral plants are especially diverse in this area. If any of you have walked through the Equinox Preserve at this time of year, it's pretty amazing. You'll see plants like this is Dutchman's Britches, but looks really similar to squirrel corn. Uh, hepatica. Uh, ramps or wild leeks, they're more commonly called here, uh, spring beauty, and then other um, species such as maidenhair fern, uh, wood nettle, and white snake root. So again, um, these plants grow um, in the Taconics and you know you might find them in certain places in the southern greens but less likely to find them there. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about what makes soil a healthy soil. And this is the organic portion of um, soil that I mentioned briefly at the beginning. This is what makes soil really alive. And as I keep mentioning, soil is so much more than dirt. There's a lot going on down there that we don't even think about or realize or even know about because it's so small and it's down below our feet. I've read that there's actually more diversity um, in the soil than there is above it in terms of number of different species present. So as you can see there, soil is a whole ecosystem in itself, as well as being that interface I talked about between um, air and water and rocks and animals. So within the soil, there is bacteria, protozoa, algae, and fungi. You know that um, great soil smell? especially after a spring rain or, you know, that smell you just really identify with soil, that's actually a bacteria, a good bacteria in the soil. It's called actinomyces, I believe, and that's putting off that smell that we associate with soil. <coughs> there are also arthropods in there. So from teeny microscopic little mites to springtails, spiders, ants, and millipedes. Some of those are shredders, so they're chewing up dead plant matter. Some of them are predators, keeping populations in check so that no um, one population explodes. Some are herbivores, and they feed on living plant roots. Maybe not ideal for us gardeners, but they're important to the system. Some are fungal feeders, meaning they feed on fungus, which then release nutrients and make them available for plants to take up. And there are earthworms in the soil, too. 
Earthworms recycle nutrients, mix up the soil, create channels for root growth. You can see they're making channels there that make it easier for roots to grow down in the soil. And their castings, um, earthworm waste, it contributes to soil structure, maybe changes it a little bit. And uh, we're going to come back to earthworms in a minute, so hold that thought. Uh, there are also larger animals in the soil ecosystem. The moles and voles that uh, create havoc in our lawns sometimes, they can be a nuisance, but they actually play a crucial role in that soil ecosystem as well. So all these organisms are necessary pieces to the whole system, and healthy plants need this system to function properly. Um, organisms decompose dead plants or get rid of the bodies. They, predators prey on plant pathogens. And some organisms even work directly with plants to get nutrients into the plant roots. A couple examples of these are uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So this is a photograph of the roots of a plant in the pea family. Um, and these little nodules here are formed by a bacteria that live in conjunction with those plant roots. And that bacteria is able to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and turn it into a form that makes it available for plants to use and be able to take up. Mycorrhizae are another example of this. This is a fungi. So again, this is another, this is a plant root there. And the white uh, tendrils around are a fungi. They live in association with plant roots and take nutrients from the soil and feed it into the plant roots. This happens a lot in forest soils, and researchers are just realizing how important and how widespread these mycorrhizae are. They're crucial to um, the successful growth of a forest. And they happen in um, garden soils as well. And again, um, people are really studying them now and finding out a lot more about them. So most of us ex instinctively sort of recognize that a dark soil is a healthy soil. And it's organic matter that gives soil that color. Organic matter is crucial for the whole soil e ecosystem. It supplies energy to those soil organisms I just talked about. It aggregates soil particles, so helps hold it together and create some structure to that soil. It holds water, and it stores carbon. People are talking a lot now about um, carbon sequestration. And soil is organic matter in soil is one area where you can sequester carbon or take carbon from the atmosphere and hold it in place instead of releasing as carbon dioxide. So that's healthy soil. And we have some pretty great soils in this area, but we also have some areas of some pretty poor, thin, overused soil. And that's because of the land use history. Alan Kaufi, in his talk um, a couple weeks ago, talked a lot about the land use history of this area, the changes our uh, landscape went through. So I'll just briefly touch back on that. Um, it's hard to know what the soil was like you know, pre-colonization. We don't really know what the soil was like here. We do know that it was that rocky glacial till. So it wasn't easy for the first farmers to till and cultivate. Um, so they used the soils around here a lot for pasture and orchards um, as well. And then the market boom that we probably have all heard about with the sheep pasture in Vermont um, and the logging. This led to rapid deforestation of the area, which uh, likely led to erosion, flooding, and subsequent sedimentation. Um, this is logging. This isn't here. I just like the drastic nature of this is what logging can do sometimes. Uh, at one point in Vermont, 75% of the land was cleared. Uh, we've flipped back and reversed that. Now only about 25% of the land is cleared. Most of that has gone back to forest. Um, but we are pretty open and cleared, which changes um, the soil chemistry and use. Uh, then we know about the market collapse and the switch from sheep pasture to dairy. Cows um, don't pasture in the same way that sheep do, and they tend to be fed hay and uh, grain at the barn and just um, go out to pasture for a little while. So a lot of the sheep pasture went back to forest, um, and what was used in dairy changed, changed the soils that were there. 
Then we hit the 20th century mechanization in chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, it might not have hit Vermont in quite the same way it did out west. Um, but this led to increased tillage and chemical use on the soils. Chemicals disrupt that soil ecosystem um, greatly that I was talking about. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, it's hard to know how much we lost. Surely it wasn't as bad as the Dust Bowl, uh, but it's still, it's still pretty significant. I actually just read, I forgot to write it down, um, an article this week that, actually there it is, we are losing, as a country, we are losing soil at a rate 10 times faster than it's forming back again. So while we're not in the Dust Bowl, we still have to really uh, think about our soils. Uh, and some current threats to our soil health right now, acid rain is one of those threats. Um, if we think back to that pH scale that I was just talking about, acid rain comes down into the soil and changes the pH of the soil, making it even lower. So fewer and fewer plant nutrients are available at those lower pHs. It also can lead to a buildup of poisonous um, metals in the soil that will kill um, plants that take those up. Uh, we're lucky in this area, the calcareous soils we have, those limestone-based soils, are able to buffer that acid rain a little bit because they're starting out at a higher pH. So the acid coming down on it does lower it, but not to um, necessarily a dangerous degree. Earthworms, I said we'd come back to earthworms. Earthworms, you know, we think, we think they're great, right? Does anybody know how many earthworms are native to Vermont? Zero. Correct. There are no native earthworms. They are all introduced species over the past 300 years. Um, you know, and we thought they were great, right? They turn up our garden soil, they contribute castings. They're actually creating havoc in our forests. Uh, I'll show you a slide in a minute, um, sort of an example of that. A uh, researcher at UVM, Dr. Gores, is doing a lot of research on this. And so what the earthworms do in the forest, they actually are too good at what they do. They're eating the duff layer of the forest. The duff layer is that slowly decomposing leaf litter uh, on the forest floor. So the earthworms churn and eat that all up. Without that duff layer, rain will just run off the forest floor. The duff layer sort of filters the rain and allows it to slowly incorporate into the soil. So without that, Rain just runs off and takes soil with it, exposing tree roots. Uh, the duff layer is also the seed bank for forest plants, especially the spring ephemerals, but trees as well. So those are either disappearing or the ones that are there aren't able to germinate as well without that nice organic layer, and they don't thrive as well. So here's an example from Dr. Gores's research. This is a photograph of a forest on Camel's Hump where they have not detected any earthworms. This is a forest in Shelburne that's invaded by, that's a species of earthworm. And you can see how there's no forest floor really. Uh, all that understory shrub isn't able to grow because the earthworms are just eating um, the food for the trees. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is new research um, and it's a, uh, it's actually a major problem in Vermont. And then another problem for our soils is that exploitation that I sort of was talking about before. Using soils, taking um, the product off site, and not, um, not uh, replenishing the system, not get feeding back into the system. So just exploiting our soils for our own use. So to end on a positive note, what can we do? What can we do about this? Organic systems tend to treat the soil much more carefully than large scale industrial agriculture. So they do things like avoiding pesticides. Pesticides hurt the soil organisms as well as you know, the pest that they're targeting. It's not just that they go and kill your um, plant pests, they get into the soil and kill those soil organisms as well. And you saw that graphic of all the different types of organisms and they're all crucial to the system. The, the chemicals of the pesticides also disrupt the soil chemistry and change things um, for the plants and organisms in there. They do things like cover cropping and conservation tillage. This is leaving um, 
plant material on the soil surface so you're not exposing bare soil. When you expose bare soil, it leads it, um, it's likely that it will erode away, you know, with a big rainstorm, it'll just wash away. If you leave that organic matter on top, it preserves the soil as well as feeds back into the soil, adds organic matter to the system. And then you can reduce or avoid tillage altogether. Tilling the soil actually releases the carbon dioxide um, that the soil is holding onto into the atmosphere, and we know carbon dioxide is a really bad greenhouse gas. <coughs> It, tilling also reduces soil structure, um, so people think it's increasing soil structure. It actually makes it more susceptible to compaction and things like that. I talked about how important the pore space is in a soil, so compaction reduces that um, air space in the soil. And tilling also exposes soil organisms to air, which can kill them. They're used to being covered in the soil. When you bring them up to the surface, they die. <coughs> In the forest, you can leave a messy forest. So this is a picture from right out here with a strange looking shadow, but um, it's a messy forest. When you leave the, plant, uh, the trees as they fall, the limbs that fall, you need to leave them in the forest because they contribute back into that soil health, the organic matter. They contribute woody debris like that, helps incorporate the, or um, foster the mycorrhizal relationships that I showed on the previous slide. Um, as well as being habitat for other animals and things. There's other reasons for this, but soil health is a big one. And when you're, uh, sorry, when you're logging as well, uh, use a smart logger who knows about these things, um, knows how to prevent soil erosion by water barring roads and things like that. And then in our home gardens, we can use compost. Um, compost instead of synthetic fertilizer. So compost again is adding that, um, that uh, organic matter back into the soil. A synthetic fertilizer is just adding that straight chemical nutrient, which plants do need, but you're not really feeding that whole ecosystem. Compost feeds that whole ecosystem. You still want to be careful in soil tests. You could over apply compost and um, put too many nutrients in there but it's always a great option instead of synthetic chemicals. And so again, at home, avoid pesticides at home. Those synthetic chemicals, you're doing harm to your soil organisms as well. And also be careful about what worms you release. I don't have a great answer for that, but when you, I know when I was a kid, my dad would get night crawlers from fishing and I would let them out in the backyard. That sounds like it's not the best idea anymore. Uh, feed those worms to the fish, I guess. <coughs> So that's all I have today. Uh, I hope I gave you a little bit better appreciation and understanding of what soil is. Um, key points are to preserve diversity, both above the ground and below the ground. Soil really is the basis for all life on land. So if anybody has any questions. Andrew, can you maybe relate a little bit um, I forgot to mention how, how what, but also how what you just talked about affects the way we're treating our forests and even our lawns and other parts of Philippines, maybe related directly to Philippines for a second. Um, yeah, so to the forest, uh, that picture of the messy forest um, is taken right uh, from here. Uh, and that's just, uh, we didn't log that area. It's just uh, a lot of stuff has fallen down in that area. But we um, are logging. Uh, we have a certain section that we're going to log this winter, and we're going to leave all that, I think they call it slash, I don't know all the proper logging terminology, but um, in the past we cleaned up after logging, you know, and pulled all that stuff away and made our forest look nice and neat. Uh, now we're not going to do that, so if you're around here, you're going to see some really messy forests. Um, that's been the key word. So Seth mentioned pollinators. I've been going to a lot of conferences about pollinators and talks and messy landscapes is the, is the new thing. It's um, for soil health as well as I explained, it's adding that organic matter back in, but it's also um, great for pollinators as well as other beneficial insects. So keep talking about diversity in the ecosystem. We need to replicate nature a little bit more than having these neat, tidy landscapes um, around. So we're, we're starting that at Hildeen. It's hard for me as a formal gardener, 
um, to do that all the time. The formal garden is still going to be uh, not quite so messy, but other gardens around here will be messier. They're going to be more debris, like I talked about agriculture, leaving um, de plant debris on the surface. We're trying to do that more and more here to feed our soil instead of using chemical fertilizers, which is a cost issue as well. Um, but really, it's more importantly, it's a healthy. We're, we're looking for a healthy ecosystem. Did that answer it, Seth, do you think? Sorry. What about uh, leaves? Can, should mm -hmm. you leave leaves on your garden and your flowers and all that and not break them off? Yeah, it's hard for me too, but yeah. It's, it's much better for it. The only caveat to that is if you have um, a disease problem. So a, a garden is, is more of a controlled landscape, you know, than, the, than a forest or sort of a, a meadow or something. So if you are having, and we've introduced these plants, so there aren't always the predators for the pathogens on our plants, if that makes any sense. Um, in a natural setting, there's going to be an ecosystem and there'll be predators to attack your pests. But when we bring in exotic things, we're bringing in exotic pests and we don't always have that same system. So in your garden, if you have, like we have peonies here, I take all the peony foliage, I get that out of there because they are really susceptible to some fungal diseases. But in a, in a um, garden where you can leave stuff, I have a butterfly garden down here, or I just leave the stuff all winter. I let it go down. So you leave it all winter and then all spring and all summer? I'm going to try this year. I'm going to see. I'm going to try to leave it. I, I, I just I know. all my old leaves off and I'm going, I'm thinking, oh my god, what am I just going to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go sprinkle them back. It's, it's hard, you know, we're, we're all trying to figure out the best way to do it. Um, but yeah, it's again, it's feeding that system. We need to feed that system. Yeah, go ahead. You may have addressed this and I may have missed it, but what are you doing here at Hilding to encourage the pollinators? What specific things are you doing? Uh, that's a great question. I didn't talk about that. We um, are planting specific pollinator plantings. That's um, native to Vermont? Yes, so native plants. So pollinators, we can go into a whole discussion on pollinators, but um, pollinators are more than honeybees are introduced, they're actually non-native. They do the bulk of our commercial pollination, but uh, native pollinators are actually as important as the honeybees are. And native pollinators co-evolved with our native plants. So in order to encourage and um, feed the native pollinators, we need to plant native plants. Um, so yes, we have some small gardens that we're starting. I put one out here. Um, there's a garden bed at, in front of this building here that we're going to plant this year with native species of plants. So echinaceas and bee balms and I'm going to blank right now on all the different things. So we're doing that um, down on the meadow where we're starting the new farm at the Dean. We're doing pollinator strips around all we have perimeter, perimeter fence around our pasture land, and along the fence, you saw that picture where there was a strip of flowers in between, it was actually grapes, but um, that's the idea we're gonna have around our um, pasture down there. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, we don't mow in the spring right away. Dandelions in your lawn, everybody hates dandelions in your lawn. They're actually crucial um, bee food for early season. Um, and what's there's, a bee? Oh, there's uh, tons of species of bees. I was up in the garden um, the other day. There, if you start looking at the bees, you'll be amazed at the diversity of bees. There's teeny little sweat bees this big to the large bumblebees and mason bees. And I can't even remember how many species of bees there are. Um, so. Uh, Yeah, Dion, um, our youth education and a naturalist, South Naturalist, and I are going to do a talk in, we haven't picked the exact date yet, but uh, probably September we're going to do a talk on how to build pollinator, how to turn your lawn into a pollinator habitat. Um, yeah, so we don't mow as much, we leave, uh, that includes uh, our meadows out there, uh, you know, our, our rougher spaces, we don't mow them as frequently. Goldenrod, everybody hates goldenrod. It's actually a really important late season bee food. Um, so just thinking about things a little more carefully and, and those, you know, getting away from manicured, highly maintained landscapes is really crucial. 
And as you mentioned, I think I mentioned it, but the, our forest management plan has at the very top pollinators. That's the, our, that's, the, that's the number one issue we're trying to do. With, if we implement the forest management plan, the thing we're trying to do, first and foremost, is maintain habitat and food source for pollinators. So people don't think uh, as much about pollinators and forests, but they're, they're crucial habitat for pollinators as well, especially that the, um, the land between, you know, between forest and uh, open land, you know, that bank there, that's really crucial habitat for pollinators. Some um, forestry species need pollinators to, you know, to better their pollination. Some things will self-pollinate and stuff, but pollinators increase pollination uh, for those plants as well. Yes? So this other, do you have a field, is that better for a pollinator than the, than the woods or the, the trees to have an open field? Yeah, yeah. Uh, pollinators need um, nectar uh, to live, pollen and nectar. And so flowering plants <clears throat> in, a, in an open meadow, you know, if you have um, milkweed for monarchs, goldenrod for late season pollinators, and a mix of other um, native plants, if you just let those meadows grow, they're likely to um, produce a lot of pollinator food. Yes? I put on mulch. I, don't ha I have pine needles, not leaves. Mm -hmm. So are there mulches you shouldn't use, or does it matter? You know, pine, does it make it? Yeah, so, so the pine-based, uh, coniferous-based mulches will acidify your soils, mm -hmm. which may not be a bad thing. My soil up here in the garden tends to be a really high pH, um, you know, high into the sevens. Mm -hmm. um, so it wouldn't hurt it to acidify that soil a little bit. Some plants don't like it that high. So I've got hydrangea up there that are showing iron chlorosis, mm -hmm. because if you remember that pH chart, iron becomes less available at those high pHs, um, and a hydrangea um, or a plant that show signs of that. Um, uh, mulch, I would just say an untreated mulch. Sometimes they treat mulch with different things and they color it and that sort of thing. Avoid those, it's not good to add to your system. Um, but yeah, I use a hardwood, um, you know, a general hardwood mulch. Anytime you can use wood chips, wood chips are a really great mulch. Um, and they seem to be, you know, in abundance around here. Um, <coughs> the, the, same, the same caveat, you know, if you have acidic soils, maybe you don't want to add it. But if you don't, it, it's probably okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I didn't realize that tilling is so detrimental to what's an alternative, you know, if you're putting together a vegetable garden. Yeah, there's a lot of um, no-till techniques. Uh, I'm not a vegetable gardener. I've, I've tried, I tried one of those. Um, there's, you can, so what I tried in a vegetable garden I started was I laid um, newspaper down on the sod. So I cut the sod, I was starting this from scratch, so from a lawn. Um, I, we scalped the lawn um, down to, you know, as tight as we could get it, laid newspaper down, and then, um, I put a straight compost mix. I would recommend a little bit more of a topsoil compost mix on top of that and plant it into that. So plant roots are going to go down into that soil level um, regardless. You know, they're going to break through that newspaper and go down into the soil. Um, and you can build up your soil that way instead of breaking it down by tilling. It's hard if you're starting a large vegetable garden in a you know, really compacted tight spot. It's hard, but there are a lot of no-till techniques out there. There's even some large-scale agriculture that organics that are starting no-till systems. It's a little complicated and it takes a little more effort, but it ends up, you know, being worthwhile in the long run. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk about compost and the various elements within it? Yeah. So um, compost. I always say uh, the same with the soil. The more diversity you put into your compost, the more diverse compost you get out. So all the different um, bacterias and fungi and all that kind of stuff um, come from different uh, source material into your compost. There's a couple different um, ways to compost. We have here, out back here, we have some bins that are cold composting. So that's what most people do at home is cold composting, you can't put, that's where you can't put your animal um, fats and that sort of thing in. It's mostly just your vegetable debris. Um, and with that, those are uh, called, 
in terms of compost greens. So that's fresh, nitrogen-rich materials. You need a component of greens and you need browns, which are the carbon-rich materials. You need a ratio of carbon to nitrogen to really effectively compost things and break them down. And I I think it's like 20 to 1 ratio. You can find that information out there. But you want, you want a good mix of greens and browns um, into your compost system. So out here we have these bins. We add to it all summer long. And then I think it's once a season, Heather, uh, moves it from one bin to the other bin. That's adding a little air to the system. Again, the compost system needs a little bit of air, just like soil does. Um, this pile, the pile I showed you of compost is um, down on our dean. This is composted goat bedding and manure. So the bulk of this material was wood chips and straw from um, our goat dairy, and then with their waste within that. Um, and this, that's probably a six month old pile. So that, I don't, I should have a before picture of what that looked like. But she turns that, we turn these piles weekly. Um, this is called hot composting. The, the temperatures in the piles, uh, ideally you want the piles to get over 131 degrees. And that breaks down plant diseases. Um, it'll break down animal fats and that sort of thing. Our piles get, this stuff gets really hot. And that's that carbon to nitrogen ratio I talked about sort of determines that temperature. Um, these run about 150 degrees at least. My first winter of doing this, I even had them at 140 degrees when it was 18 degrees outside. I have this big thermometer we stick in there. The past few winters, they've gone cold and we're not exactly sure why. Um, but again, this compost is a great compost, but it doesn't have a diverse um, source of materials going in it. We are also starting um, a, a large bin system where we're going to incorporate the food scraps from all the weddings and that sort of um, all our events like that, mix it with my garden debris, so all the cuttings from the garden, and some of the goat uh, manure and bedding in a recipe. So you, they call it a recipe for compost. So a certain amount of the garden debris, a certain amount of food waste, a certain amount of wood chips and that sort of thing. Um, to get an ideal mix to make this really rich compost. It'll have a lot more of that um, diversity within it. All right. I think that's good. Thank you.